I feel incredibly lucky to, um, to be in this room with so much really awesome and rambunctious conversation going on. So thank, thank you all so much. It's what's making this event um, successful. I really uh, am excited to hear so many of the interchanges and conversations that are going on already. So we're going to um, come back together again. We're going to have our second panel discussion. And this one will be focused on policy. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to this for a lot of reasons. Um, one is that as I started moving into the world of policy, um, and yet still being participating in a lot of conversations about media and kids, I felt like we never quite got to the actual like big questions like, wait, what needs to change in the way we conceive our schools and the way we understand early learning centers and the way we think about preparing teachers? What needs to change to get us to um, a new plane, a new plane of understanding um, of using media with kids um, in developmentally informed ways and creative ways. So this is exciting to have this moment. And um, what we're going to do is, and, and my kind of not so hidden agenda here is to um, have you all take, take a minute to hear some, some ideas we've been putting together at the New America Foundation. And um, so we're going to take a few minutes where I'll just describe some of those. And then we'll have our next panel of experts come up and Sarah Mead will be moderating. I'll introduce her formally at that time. But um, let me take a minute to ask if, and I hope you all have it, as you walked in today, if you had a chance to pick up this paper, and there are copies of it outside if you haven't grabbed it yet, um, Envisioning a Digital Age Architecture for Early Education. This, um, I hope, is going to pr prime the pump for some new conversations about how to think about early education policy in a digital age, um, how to be better prepared for what's coming for our teachers and our kids. And, um, and, I, and I really do hope it might be just the beginning. There's a reason that this particular paper and report and these slides I'm going to show you, they don't have policy prescriptions in them. And that's because we really feel like we're at the beginning of this conversation. And there's so many uh, experts and, um, and practitioners who need to be in the conversation to really understand what we should do next. But what we wanted to do was to start kind of laying the, the, the cornerstones of, of a new way of thinking about early education um, or think about this in terms of some new kind of blueprints we could work from. Um, I just had a lot of architectural analogies in my head as I was working on this, on this paper. So you'll see some of that um, laced through. And, um, and I want to say thanks to three um, foundations that have made the work on this paper possible. Um, it just in that they've been very generous in enabling us at the Early Education Initiative to have some time to think about where technology fits. And that's the Foundation for Child Development, the Grable Foundation, and um, the Pritzker Children's Initiative. So I just wanted to say thanks to those, um, to those philanthropies. OK, so the title, um, again, is Envisioning a Digital Age Architecture for Early Education. And the idea is that just as buildings change with the arrival of new technologies, right, just as you know, when we had plate glass or indoor plumbing or electric lighting, we started changing kind of the structure of our buildings. And the same should be and really is already happening in early education. Um, and again, we're thinking early education here as birth through the third grade. There's already a lot of change afoot in this area. So for those of you who are not following every kind of uh, every single move that's going on in the early childhood policy world, there's a lot going on right now. Um, obviously, the administration is, is very interested in and wants to promote better uh, learning environments for more and more children. But we are also um, learning from developmental science um, that there's a lot the children have a capacity to, to learn a lot when they're put in the right environments. And that's led to a lot of higher expectations for children and a lot of higher expectations um, for educators and caregivers. And there are many reforms underway to try to help meet those expectations. And I, I uh, put together some of these ideas um, very much to think of them as embedded in that larger reform conversation that's already going on. So um, as, you, as you hear me talk about some of this, it's, it's really 
not as something to do separately from reforms that are already underway, but as something to think about and injecting into the reform conversation at various points. So let me kind of, um, also raise what I'm sure is on the minds, particularly of those of you who might run early childhood programs or um, those of you who are really dependent on funding streams. And that is that we cannot forget that early childhood um, programs, particularly those that are aimed at children under age five, are underfunded. And it is hard sometimes to talk about where technology fits in an environment where many of these programs are already just kind of barely keeping it together to be able to keep the, the salaries that they want to keep to, uh, to um, keep the teachers um, that they want to keep to maintain and even kind of elevate teaching practice. All of those are expensive things, and we're working in an environment of resource scarcity. Um, and so I do understand how it can be really tempting then to just avoid talking about technology in this context, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine how we possibly would have room for this on top of everything else that's being asked of the early childhood environment. Um, but I think that to ignore this would be a mistake. And I, I say that because um, there are a host of issues that might be able to be tackled by some of the technologies that are available to us if we're using them in smart ways. Addressing concerns of inequality and digital divides is obviously one. But there's also a chance now for educators and policymakers to, to bend the technology marketplace towards them, right? Towards us <laughs> um, to, to help the, those who are out there developing things to recognize what teachers really need and what parents really need based on science. Um, there's a huge opportunity now for enabling new connections to resources so that teachers have that ability, um, new materials for use in their classrooms, new tools of communication, new partnerships for cost savings, and not to mention collaboration and creativity um, by, by children as well as by educators and parents. And as states and communities create new systems, because many of them are already trying this, right? They're really trying to create connections between what for a very long time had been very siloed between the Head Start community or, or child care providers or state-funded pre-K or what's happening in elementary schools. And there's a really, I think, exciting effort underway to make a lot of connections between these. But are we using technology to its fullest um, extent in, in making those connections possible? So we have laid out here five actions that we think should be taken. And, with, and under each action are a lot of questions. And I just want to take you through briefly what those are. And then I will turn it over to Sarah and we'll start our panel. So one of the first ones that we think um, needs to be foremost in policymakers' minds is to aim high. And this is, and, and we explain it uh, in the report in more depth, but it's really the idea that we know a lot now about how important the interaction is between the caregiver and parent and a child. And that those can't be just kind of rote, like one-off conversations. Um, this can't just be about like putting out construction paper and some paste and like figuring that kids are gonna learn, you know, what they need to learn. Um, we need to be thinking about quality all the time when we're thinking about the experiences that kids have, and let's make sure that we are using that same quality lens when we are imagining how technology might be used with kids. Um, there's a lot of other ways that we can certainly aim high in terms of our, our standards for the way we use um, technology, and we lay out a few of those ideas in the report. We also think that there needs to be a huge effort on boosting the workforce to make it possible to use new technologies in ways that um, spark children's um, creativity, enable them to, to see themselves as analysts, to see themselves as um, creators, as artists. And that's going to happen when we have a workforce, um, and this is absolutely needed in the in the grades, you know, under kindergarten. But I don't think we should forget about what's happening in K three and how squeezed the teachers in our elementary schools might feel, and how maybe little support they have received in their education schools to be able to do what we need to do to to bring um, kids those rich learning opportunities. So we talk about there's been s some reports on this already. Um, one 
Take a Giant Step um, was put out by the Joan Gantz Cooney Center a couple of years ago, and we we borrow liberally <laughs> from some of those ideas, but but also from from several others that have come um, come along as we're thinking about education school reform generally and teacher preparation reform um, as well. Tapping hidden assets is kind of a third action that I want to explain a little bit for you because it might not be obvious at first. And that is the idea that we right now, in part because of silos, we aren't taking full advantage of resources that already exist and many of them are paid for by our, our you know, taxpayer dollars and yet we're not connecting them to teachers and to early learning centers. We're not enabling public schools to fully take advantage of them. And they are things like what's happening in our public libraries and the kind of store of resources that are now available in public libraries including ebooks and, and all sorts of, kind of online materials that could be of use to both um, teachers and children. Another um, kind of hidden asset that we see out there is um, what our, our public media um, has made available over the years, what's been put out on public TV um, through PBS or through other outlets, and, and how can we use some of those assets and repurpose them for use in, in classrooms or enable them to um, be part of teacher preparation programs in new ways. And the last one under hidden assets is thinking about the developers of media for kids. A lot of them are not connected in any way to the education community, are not really connected in any deep way to the child development and research community. And, and that is leading to the creation of apps out there that may just really not make sense in the context of children's lives. I mean, they might sound good at first, like, oh, yay, ABCs, I can do kind of flashcards with my kids. But is that really, is that really reflecting what we're learning from research that children need? So how can we tap into, I think, a very enthusiastic developer community to try to orient um, what they're producing in a way that's useful to, to kids and, and really kind of helping them um, learn and thrive? Another one is to connect information, I'm sorry, to, to do a better job of connecting to information and to each other. And in this section of the paper, we are focusing in on um, the need to understand internet connectivity, broadband access, not only in what's always kind of traditionally called kind of K-12, but also to recognize the needs in our early learning centers. And to, quite frankly, recognize that even in our K-12, and I want to say really it's pre-K-12 environments, we do not have the access that we might, we as adults sitting in our offices with always on access, th that kind of access is not always available in those classrooms in the way we, we think it might be. Um, and, and it might be strange to imagine that um, a classroom full of three-year-olds needs internet access, but what about that teacher who wants to be able to connect to or show a video for 30 seconds that um, is going to lead kids into some sort of cool adventure they're going to do on the playground. Um, how are we enabling teachers to kind of be flexible with their practice and how can we use internet access to do that? Um, there's a lot more in that section. I want to give a quick nod to Lindsay Teepee, who is um, a colleague of mine at New America who has been doing a lot of research on that front. So thank you, Lindsay. And then lastly, um, we see a real need to do more investigation. And ultimately, this means more research, but it means research that can be really applied <laughs> to what's happening in classrooms and research that is um, as much as possible devoid of vested interests. And those vested interests can come in the form of philanthropies, quite honestly, right? And certainly they can come in the form of corporations. They can also come in the form of the researchers themselves and their own kind of biases and that, that they bring to it. So how do we, using policy, create a, a vaster array of new research and experiments, longitudinal studies, um, surveys, that can ensure that we're seeing a full range and a diversity of, of, of information on what's working with young children and what's not, or what's working as we um, try to help teachers and what's not. So those are the five um, pieces of this new digital age architecture that we're imagining here. And um, I am now going to turn over the discussion to Sarah Mead. And I just want to say a big thank you to Sarah. Um, Sarah is a senior associate um, partner at Bellwether 
uh, Education Partners, which is a, a firm here in DC that does a wide array of research and analysis on a host of issues from the earliest years all the way up through um, higher education. And, and so many of you may know also that Sarah is, uh, in addition to being a good friend of mine, she, um, she's the one who brought me to New America many, many years ago, So I, um, before we were good friends. Um, <laughs> and so I want to thank her for, for being here. So please um, join me in welcoming Sarah. Wherever you want to sit, yeah. So we have, um, you know, earlier in, in the afternoon, we, we talked about sort of research and practice, and now we're going to transition into talking about some of the policy implications of um, all these developments we've been looking at related to young children and technology and some of the tensions and questions that we were talking about earlier. And to do that, we are fortunate to have a really great and diverse panel here with us. Um, Ann Hansen is the Senior Research and Policy, Senior Manager of Research and Policy Initiatives at the Ounce of Prevention Fund. In that role, she advances the organization's national efforts to scale innovative early education programs and policies that serve at-risk young children and families. And part of that work includes directing the Ounce's Digital Learning Initiative, which explores the potential of digital media and technology to promote effective early education practice and family engagement. And we'll hear a little bit more about what that initiative actually does a little bit later. Um, we also have Chip Donahue, who is the Dean of Distance Learning and Continuing Education at the Erickson Institute, where he's leading the development of online master's credential and continuing education programs for early childhood educators, as well as directing the Technology and Early Childhood Center at Erickson. Um, in addition to his work at Erickson, uh, Dr. Donahue is a senior fellow at the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning in the Children's Media, where he co-chaired the group that revised the 2012 NACI Joint Position Statement on Technology and Interactive Media as Tools in Early Childhood Programs. Um, we also have uh, Michelle Figler, who is the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Alliance for the Education of Young Children, an um, affiliate of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, serving a 10-county region in southwestern Pennsylvania. And we have Lori Romero, who coordinates and supervises the Child and Family Library Services Department for the Arapahoe Library District, located in the south suburban area of Denver, Colorado, where her primary focus is meeting the needs of families of children ages 0 to 3 and their parents and supporting their development and education. So before we get into talking about some of the specific questions um, and some of the specific work that you do, I would just love to hear if anybody has any immediate gut reactions to the earlier conversation that we had um, or to the video or to Lisa's um, presentation and recommendations with a specific view towards either policy or your work and specific implications you'd like to draw out on this panel. Sure, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. Boost the workforce and connect mm -hmm. were two of her things and that's absolutely right what we're talking about. So that's critical. I also um, want to call for a common definition of screen time in the digital age. And we need to rally the AAP, Caring for Our Children, ECHR, state licensing organizations, accreditation, teacher preparation programs. We're all talking about it in a different way. And everywhere we're talking about it is out of date. So I think that's a really critical policy opportunity for us here. I would say tap the hidden assets. I have to be the library advocate. Um, it really is just these resources are pretty abundant. Um, in libraries in terms of staff that are chomping at the bit to support parents, staff that are already working with parents um, and their kids together, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but the resources like online uh, ebooks and online resources as well, um, we're really ready for common conversations and collaborations, so I'm excited about that. I think it's important for us to remember just the underfunding of the field in general. So when you spoke of that, how do we remember, even with all the progress that, that we're making, the, the strain on the workforce, the strain on the uh, early care and education field, and as we have all these opportunities, because 
folks are talking about it now more than ever. How do we make sure that people understand the reality of what the field is today? Mm -hmm. So I think that's critically important. I would just add, um, first off, I think all of the questions raised in the brief, um, I loved how specific they were. They really resonate with what we're seeing in Chicago. Chip and I are, are colleagues in Chicago, in Illinois, um, and in states across the country. Um, and as I was trying to think about sort of the common thread across those, one thing that struck me is, as we think about early childhood policy as is, concurrent state, we don't actually really address technology, like at all. Um, and that's for better or for worse, and when we do, it's to Chip's point in this sort of very narrow frame of we're gonna try and assign limits, we're gonna prevent harm. And so I think what this brief helps us do and this conversation is helping us do is try to shift that frame from this prevention mode where we're limiting and discouraging the use of digital media and technology to one where we're allowing for that creative use that we know is out there and where we're enabling and maybe even promoting effective and developmentally appropriate use. And I think that's a big shift and it's gonna take us a while. We have members in our own community that we need to bring along with us. Um, but I think that's really where we need to go and so I really appreciated all the questions that were posed in the brief to help us raise those in our local context. So there's a lot of, of rich stuff in those reactions that I want to get back to in a moment, but I wanted to segue, you know, using your great point about the conversation about early childhood education frequently mm -hmm. not talking about technology, to just ask, you know, why does the conversation need to include attention to technology? Why are organizations like the OUNCE engaging on technology, which I think probably surprises a lot of people to learn that that's an initiative that you mm -hmm. have, and, and then if you could tell us a little bit more about specifically what you're doing there, I think that would be helpful as well. Yeah. Um, well, for those of you who don't know, the Ounce Prevention Fund um, is based in Chicago, Illinois, but we're actually a national organization committed to, I think our mission is, oh, Tony's going to kill me. Our, our mission is to <laughs> ensure that young children at risk uh, achieve their full potential. And we focus on um, children and their families from birth to five years old in low-income communities. And we have four, uh, three core areas of work, research, practice, and policy. Um, and across each of those domains, what we're really looking for is what are the highest quality learning experiences we can provide for young children, whether that's at home or in an early learning setting. And so for any early childhood organization that is interested in ensuring those high quality experiences, you need to be concerned about technology and how it's used. Because we, want it, we don't want it to be used poorly, and we want it to be used well if it is. Um, and so to the extent that evidence from practice and evidence from research tells us that these new exciting tools can either inhibit or enhance quality experiences or inhibit and enhance outcomes for children and families. We need to have an informed opinion and perspective on that and that perspective in turn needs to inform sort of the policies that we're talking about today. Um, and that's going to take a while and it's, it has to be a thoughtful conversation obviously but I think there's also an urgency to these questions and I think Lisa does a great job of raising this early on in the brief that technology is here. It's already in our homes. Um, teachers are already using it in classrooms and parents and teachers alike are really eager for information. If you provide teachers and parents with information, they will use it, they will apply it. We know this from our, from our work on, on the ground and so we need to respond to that demand. Um, and so we really just owe it to ourselves, to our field, and to the children and families we're serving to have a really informed pers perspective on this and ensure that the policies we're all talking about really are ensuring those high quality experiences for kids. Yeah. And, I, and I did want to just get back to this issue about policy. You know, not We could talk a lot about a lot of different kinds of policies, and we will as we go through this conversation, but um, my guess is that there are some areas where policy overlaps with technology and early childhood right now that are not well understood by the field. Um, you know, for example, you mentioned a variety of ways in which policy intersects with screen time and um, would love to just unpack a little bit more what are some of those specific ways that it comes up, where are some of the biggest areas where perceptions or misperceptions about technology get reflected in early childhood policies and where is that creating um, you know, potentially barriers for, for doing what's right for kids. Let me jump in. Um, I used to lovingly refer to our early childhood colleagues as low-tech, high-touch, because we really didn't want to deal with technology. We wanted to do this. We wanted to come together. We're not going to do a webinar. We're going to come together. We're, not, we're going to take a, a continuing education course in the room at the same time. Um, a lot of that's changed, and it's changed because we're all carrying one of these. And so if you have a room full of early childhood people and they say, I don't do tech, and you say, how many of you have a smartphone, and they all raise their hand, 
you actually can call the question around how, you know, how non-technological are you. So I think that, that's one. Technology, when it has been in an early childhood program, has been in the office. It's been a tool for administration. It's often been a computer that was donated by parents when it was already obsolete, and it's still on the desk of the administrator many years later. So you know, we struggle to, to stay up. Um, I'm very excited about this particular device, but this isn't what's in early childhood programs, most early childhood programs. Um, it's locked down desktop computer that was also donated by parents years ago. So um, I think we have to look at the realities of, of what we're excited about and where it's going, um, but also what's really out there in the field. I'll just add that I think that the policies, especially as we're uh, uh, embarking on some real investments around pre-K education, both on the federal level and, um, and, in, and in many states, really have to be able to dig deeper to see are the standards aligned in the way that we really talk about all the time. So we talk about how we want quality early childhood programming for children so they can be ready for school, but we're not digging down to see is that policy, is there even a policy on technology or I would say digital media learning? We really have to have a new, new definition that we're actually setting our children up to not be prepared to do the math game that your daughter and my son now does in second grade. So we're not aligning curriculum anywhere. So the question to me is, so when you walk into an early childhood classroom, people ask, why is there a computer in there? Mm -hmm. You walk into a second grade classroom, you ask, why isn't there a computer in there? We have to fix that. And that, and that policy really needs to look at that. And so you raise really the issue of standards here, and, and there are two really critical sets of standards that we think about in early childhood education. One being you know, early learning standards or ch standards for what, what children should learn and know and be able to do. And then the second being quality standards at a program level in terms of you know, both, both inputs but also what should we actually see and what should be happening. And there's probably a third set around, around educators, but I want to hold off on that for a moment because it's such a rich topic. Um, but let's talk about what, what's the current state of our standards, both for children and for programs regarding technology, and you know, where do we need to take another look at what those state standards look like, potentially, in either of those areas? So we've had a great opportunity in uh, Pennsylvania, and Barb Mitzenberg's here, the Deputy Secretary of the Office of Child Development and Early Learning. So through a grant from, from the Grable Foundation, we've actually been able to push the envelope a bit. So in Pennsylvania, like many states, we use the environmental rating scale when we go in to look at a setting, and there's a suite of those, of those tools. And uh, folks were getting stuck on the screen time mm -hmm. criteria and how the, the, the limit on screen time and what is screen time and what does that mean and how does what's happening with Message for Me, which is happening in classrooms in Pittsburgh, when the assessor would walk in and say, well, is that screen time or isn't that screen time? Mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem very much like screen time because <laughs> children are interacting, but there is a screen. So we've actually been able to, with, with the support of Octel, kind of uh, turn everything upside down mm -hmm. and have assessors look at digital media literacy differently. We're also at an advantage, right? Because we have the Fred Rogers Center in our backyard. We have the Fred Rogers mm -hmm. Company. I mean, we have this right here. However, we've had leadership that has said, how do we look at this differently? Um, Barb and her team has also been able to have now regular conversations with Dick Clifford and his team about how do we think differently about the ERS? How can we think differently about what is de developmentally appropriate? So, um, and, and I think those conversations just have to continue to, to, to happen, but it takes all of us sort of pushing the envelope a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I, think, I, I think the other thing, so that's kind of a big one. I think there's a very easy one that uh, we have sort of taken on as a local AEYC. And it goes back to what someone said about the professional or how we perceive the person working in the field. We've actually challenged programs to look at their cell phone policies. I know that seems really silly, doesn't it? But it's a very easy policy that can be changed tomorrow. It doesn't take Octel or, or mm -hmm. legislation. We come from this, this lens that, oh, if an early childhood teacher has her phone out, then she must not be working. Mm. Now, can you imagine that? Because you <coughs> you're on your phone. You're tweeting, <laughs> you're texting, right, right? I see, I see lots of phones. 
We have to change that mm -hmm. because, and those are easy policies. So I, we've been trying to chip away at easy things for mm -hmm. programs. You can change that policy tomorrow and treat that professional like a professional instead of saying no cell phone because you're cutting off opportunity. Yeah. I think that's a really great perspective about these sort of simple, incremental but powerful policy changes you can make at a local level because I think the really daunting thing here is that in early childhood we serve many masters, right? So um, we, most high quality programs are braiding a variety of public funding streams, whether that's Head Start or child care or their state pre-K dollars. And although I think Race to the Top and the new movement around QRISs in states are really pushing those systems to unify and align their standards, those things in Illinois are separate on their views on technology. And so there really needs to be an, al an alignment conversation in districts and in states mm -hmm. about how do we ensure that, so my child care licensing says I can only have 30 minutes a week, but right. Let's Move says this. But in the early learning standards, it says I should integrate technology in, in my science curriculum. So how do, you, how do we help support local programs in understanding and aligning all those things to really ensure that they can use the tools they want to when they want to to promote learning. I think that's a much more daunting but important yeah. conversation that needs to happen locally. And I would just have to say that <clears throat> policy to validate informal learning mm -hmm. yeah. um, environments like the library are really important. And now obviously that cost cutting thing about across all those standards in, in most states now is the, the early learning and development standards for children or you know, if, if you're talking about Head Start, the Head Start mm -hmm. framework. And I guess I'm curious, you know, one, to what extent do people see those as reflecting or not reflecting or ignoring technology as part of children's development? But then if, if we wanted to talk about how could we enhance the role of technology in that, do we actually have a consensus on what young children should know and be able to do when it comes to technology? And do we have the research base to get there? I don't think there's a consensus. <laughs> And there's so much, I think one of the challenges of early learning standards is just um, last week I was looking at Pennsylvania standards actually which are great on technology and really emphasize integrating it but also have learning standards about technology in daily lives and how it's important and they do want children, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. to be able to know what they're for and how you use them. Whereas in Illinois, uh, Chip and I, uh, you know, I think it was last spring, we're going through a revision process on our Illinois early learning standards and I did a search and I think the word technology in like an 85 page document came up twice. Mm -hmm. And so there's just great disparity across states about how they've approached it and it really depends on those local partners who are advocating for their state policymakers or their, those early learning councils or other tables where these decisions are being made. There needs to be advocacy there to ensure that technology is addressed if that's the local demand. And I think because of what Ela said, because technology is so rapid, the um, early learning standards can't be created, then put on a shelf. Right. So, and unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of times. So how do you bring them out and say, okay, so what technologies do we have that can actually overlay this? And how do we think about this differently or, or in a new way? So I think that that is also critically important because the standards have to keep up with what technology is doing as well. I also think that there has to be um, a lot more research on how children learn, but sort of what are the precursors? So I think that, you know, Sue, uh, Brenda Camp's here, and I remember the first time I saw a Heads Up reading, right? So I, I, when I was a, a much younger teacher, but not, <laughs> but not very young. And you actually then broke down for us how we teach reading to young children. So I think about this a lot, that we need that same research when it comes to technology. Because if my second grader is being asked to to complete first in math on his computer, but he doesn't have the skills he needs to get there. And especially when we think about families who don't have opportunity, we have to get down to breaking that down in the same way we did around reading, I think. And I think the opportunities there, I think that would really help us give really, um, it would help early childhood teachers, I think. And let's shift to talking about teachers then. Um, you know, I think the issue of do teachers have the skills in technology has come up a number of times and the need to really think about the human capital piece of this. I um, would love, Chip, to hear you talk a little bit about what some of the implications are for early childhood educator preparation and sort of pre-service or, or in-service, since many people do it in-service, programs for teachers. Uh, um, yeah, so if we want to look for the problem in teacher preparation, it is the teacher prepares, of which I am one. <laughs> 
right? So I'm calling myself and my colleagues out. <laughs> we are not digitally media literate. We are not preparing teachers who are going to graduate this May from institutions all across this country to know how to use these tools wisely. We've got a problem at the top, um, and, and that's, a, that's a big issue. When I think of technology and teacher preparation, though, there are multiple layers to this. So it's technology as a tool for preparing teachers, online learning and other strategies that we're using that, that I use every day, right, to reach teachers and, and prepare them. It's technology that teachers use for their teaching and in their teaching um, that with assessment and documentation and other strategies. And then it's ultimately the technology we all want to spend our time <coughs> talking about, which is technology with young children in classrooms. Um, but I think we need to look at, at all of those. Um, if we have teacher educators, and this is not just higher ed now, right? It's professional development providers. Um, it's trainers of early childhood folks. It's administrators of programs who train their own staff. I mean, we got lots of layers to this. Um, I, I go back to what Eli said about how fast it's going. That's either a problem or an opportunity. I choose to see it as an opportunity. I say every time to early childhood people, none of us know what this is all about. Isn't that great? <laughs> Let's figure it out together. Let's go together. We don't really know, but we know that they're already there. It's already happening. So I think that's, that's a big deal. We have Take a Giant Step, which, which um, Lisa talked about. We have the NAYC and Fred Rogers Center Joint Position Statement. We have some guidance here, um, but I, I really do believe one of our challenges is, is in the preparation of teachers. We did a study at the Tech Center um, recently where we looked at, stay with me on this one, we did a sort of, of early childhood teacher education programs in the United States, higher ed, mm -hmm. who, who issued degrees, who taught online as well. Because we made an assumption that if they're already online, it means they've already made friends with technology, they're probably most likely, it, maybe it's a false assumption. There's very little going on, folks. If there's anything at all, it's a course. It's not integrated, and yet we want teachers to come out of their teacher preparation ready to integrate. Mm -hmm. But we don't integrate ourselves. If it's any topic, it's about how they use technology for teaching, tools. So learning to be more um, effective as a teacher, but not, again, digital media literacy with young kids. So I, I think we really, we've got to look at the policy implications of our teacher preparation programs being way behind the curve on this one. And lots of teacher educators I know have hair color that's very similar to mine and are saying, <laughs> That's for the younger faculty. No, it can't be for the younger faculty. It's for all faculty. We have to take this on and get on with it, just in the same way that we're asking early childhood educators to take it on and get on with it. What also just strikes me as a huge barrier for the field, what you're saying about how few programs are using technology in the sense that as we talk about how we can help people who may be non-traditional learners who are already working as early childhood right. educators to raise their level of skills and credentials, you know, many of those people are in places where they may not have, you know, rural areas, so forth, where they may not have access to traditional in-person higher education, and, and we may be missing out on a big opportunity there. Yeah, so there's, there's a, uh, our mantra at the Tech Center is you've got to use technology to figure out how to use technology. <laughs> you've got to use technology to know why you want to use technology. you just got to do it, right? We have a really fun blended learning project going on with the Office of Catholic Schools in Chicago right now around these issues and around connected mm -hmm. learning. Uh, that has face-to-face -face components and has webinar live, you know, in time, has an online community of practice, has people practicing being in a community of practice, practicing what it means to be a peer-to-peer -peer learner, practicing what it means to share resources with others. We're just playing with it. Yep. Um, but that's the, that's the point, and that's really the level that we're at. Um, so we can actually learn about how to teach with technology by using technology um, and, and thinking about it. Michelle, I wanted to see if you wanted to elaborate on this from a professional development perspective, since I know that's, that's part of what you do. Absolutely. So I think I, I'll stick with the, with the access for, for a moment. I think it's also critical that we have policy that allow early childhood settings to have access. So whether it's through E-rate or other, or other uh, mechanisms, because programs are shut out of access. When we tried Message for Me in the beginning, remember, Ela, that was one of our biggest challenge was how do we get access, how do we get that ongoing internet access. We didn't, we realized it was going to be an issue, we just didn't realize how big of an issue it was. And this was both in urban and rural settings. So I think we have to figure out policies around that. And um, I think we also just have to, to, to address that folks are going to need these tools. So uh, once again, we, we, we have a great opportunity in our professional development with, with Octel and uh, 
in uh, philanthropy to actually get these tools into classrooms. Then you have to couple that with, with professional development. The uh, Message From Me project, sometimes we forget it's technology. That's what makes it so good. Because what's wrapped around the Message From Me project is lots of professional development on how this meets early learning standards. The number one goal of Message From Me is to increase communication between parent and child and teacher. That's the number one goal. When somebody talks about technology, I forget that there's technology involved. So it has become a tool. I think we also have to really think about um, professional development in non-traditional ways. So these are new conversations that I don't know a lot about, but um, badging. I know that's a, a conversation we are having in, in, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, and I think that it could really help the early childhood community get credit for things that they're doing every day. I also think we need to have policies that allow early childhood professionals especially family child care providers, I'll, I'll call the, that very special group that are very dear to me, that when they attend a children's museum or they attend a library, that that counts for professional development hours. We have to be able to figure that out. We cannot have either local or state policies that put up a wall that say, because the librarian doesn't have an early childhood certificate, she's not teaching that provider something. We have got to to um, examine that. And finally, I'll say we, we have to figure out a way to get our early childhood professionals out of their setting and visiting something else. What's the chances of an early childhood person and someone that invents robots getting together just because? It was an intentional meeting. I had to get out of my comfort zone. Someone had to help me make that happen. We have to get our, our, our early childhood professionals to be in other spaces and share their expertise. It's reciprocal and share their expertise. So I think that's a great transition to a question I wanted to ask Lori. Um, before that, I just wanted to say I'm so glad you mentioned badges because uh, Kevin Carey, who uh, directs the education program at New America Now, and I wrote a paper calling for using the post-secondary badge system more to get access for early childhood credentials. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Lori, sort of, you mentioned earlier libraries as this undertapped and underappreciated asset in the early childhood space, particularly related to technology. And Michelle was just talking about the potential to, to look at libraries as a source of professional development. Tell me a little bit about how you see libraries fitting in here and sort of specifically some of the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, I don't know when the last time you went to a library story time was. Anybody? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> So those of you who have, may have noticed, uh, it's just really a fertile ground for um, helping parents to understand best practices that they can incorporate. It's a great space for, for great conversations about what's best for kids. And it's also a place where librarian, children's librarians who I love are modeling best ways to read, sing, talk, play, write with kids. Um, story times in our district, for example, uh, have a play, purposeful play period afterward, where the librarians are actually roving and modeling open-ended questions to stimulate dialogic <laughs> conversations that are rich. They're um, modeling positivity with parents. They're now, some story times, they're experimenting to learn about the technology um, by incorporating digital experiences, uh, experimenting with apps with parents, and talking about how to best use those technologies to um, help their kids learn. Now, we're experimenting, um, which is, it makes me feel good that you said that's OK. <laughs> but, um, I do feel like libraries are really unbelievable. And I spent more than 20 years in education in the public schools and just came to libraries recently. So uh, I'm just absolutely blown away at the possibilities. You know why? Because the parents are there with the kids. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the, the key point is that this is an opportunity to reach out to the parent as the first best teacher. Um, 
And that's what librarians are doing through uh, Every Child Ready to Read practices in, in story times and programs. And we're, we're experimenting with programs like, uh, in our district, we have one called Tech Together, where it's actually parents with kids on laps and uh, tablets on laps of kids. And they're um, working together with a librarian helping to model the best use of the, the app, and then the kids talking, engaging in rich conversations together with the parent. And so there are these opportunities for real learning experiences that um, I just want you to come visit. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. Yeah. I think this brings up a really great point that was made in the paper as well about the need for alignment across yeah. mm -hmm. libraries and early education schools and other uh, pediatricians' offices because locally, parents, who do they go to when they have a question? It's their family or it's their librarian or their early childhood teacher or their doctor. And so if there was some sort of like aligned messaging, and we're getting better about that, but the idea that they're going to these different places and if they're hearing different things about how to use technology or whether they even should, that's got to be a sort of confusing and overwhelming space to be in as a young parent. Let me just yeah. jump into yeah. the, the shout out to the, our librarian friends. I think this topic, because I've been out talking about it since the position statement came out in March of 2012, has created this amazing conversation and opportunity. Um, with informal educators, be they children's librarians, children's museum staff, zoos and nature center staff, out of school time programs, folks that aren't usually in the same room at the same time are having very similar experiences and asking similar questions around how do we use these tools wisely, what's the best way to proceed. I, th I think we have an opportunity to really form a new alliance in a way that, um, that strengthens all of us and that, that puts the librarian in, in a really critical place. And, and if we're going to talk about access and equity, then we have to focus on public libraries as a key part of that strategy. Um, and so I, I, d I just think, and my own experience in the last year has been lots of excitement in the library community. But as I said to you earlier, also librarians who say no iPads in my library, mm -hmm. and early childhood the teachers needle. who say no technology in my early childhood program. So we still have this, this big um, continuum. So I was talking yeah. about just some little yeah. examples of programs at the grassroots level, but I want to shout out to Ken Campbell, who is um, a California library person, and she's really trying to forge ahead to mobilize um, librarians to be active in um, studying young children and digital experiences, and I know has worked with CHIP and others uh, writing a grant. Nas I'm reading it because she was just telling me about it. <laughs> National Forum on Young Children, New Media and Libraries, working to um, get guidelines, generate guidelines, and train the trainer curriculum. So that alignment's really going to be key. Mm -hmm. so. it's, it's also key because uh, many uh, family child care providers, that's where they're getting yeah, access. Absolutely. 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 Right? Yes. So if they don't have access in their home, then we promote trying to get them to the library. And then so if we have a common way of talking about it, and we're all using the early learning standards like we do in Pennsylvania, and especially locally, then that's where the access is going to happen. And that, that, that librarian, because he or she is in the community, is trusted by that family child care provider. And they feel like they can question more because they'll say to us, but the librarian said, Michelle, <laughs> that this was an OK app. So I think it's an OK app. <coughs> and I'll say, of course, the librarian said that. So I think that that's, that is critically important, because that's where family child care providers go. And we have to remember, that's where our most at-risk children, especially birth to three, are spending their day. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And we want to collaborate. We want to partner. We want to be aligned and have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open it up for questions in a couple minutes, but before we do that, um, because this is sort of an action-oriented policy uh, conversation, wanted to ask each of you to share, so if you were going to pick one number one action step related to policy that, that sort of needs to be taken tomorrow to enable us to really capture the potential of technology to improve outcomes for young children, what would it be? <laughs> um, leverage this kind of meeting to convene a conversation around teacher preparation standards and how they relate to preparing teachers to use digital media appropriately and intentionally in early childhood programs. I would say um, 
at the local level, because we know so much of this policy plays out locally, whether it's in your district or in your state, I'd say whatever table in your area is thinking about these types of questions, to sort of take an inventory of what are the policies that are affecting technology. Ask yourselves, are they aligned? Are they where we want to be? Do they reflect our values and the changing landscape we're seeing in our classrooms? And really use that then to guide, OK, what are those small things we can change immediately to get some momentum? And then what are then the bigger things that are going to take sort of a heavier lift for us, but we're committing to do it? Just, and as a practical yeah. matter on that, do you know of any frameworks or tools that currently exist that a local you know, coalition or policymaker or somebody could actually use to do that kind of an I inventory? That's a great idea. If someone in this room <laughs> wants to collaborate on creating that, I, I think it would be, it's so needed. I think we're all just sort of figuring it out as we go along, and that would be a fantastic tool. I think it's one of the things that we've really done in Pittsburgh, right? So we have the Kids and Creativity Network, and it really does bring this um, early childhood affinity group together, which brings people from from the early childhood classroom to ELA's team at the Create Lab to the Children's Museum. I mean, people that you wouldn't think would be in the room together to really put those easy wins on the table, like cell phone policy, mm -hmm. to kind of bigger things of bigger lifts together. So, um, and how do we use our voices collectively? Because we know in advocacy, the more voices you have, the louder you are, the more you can push push the agenda. So it's been powerful that it's not always the early childhood community that policymakers are hearing from, yeah. that we have an aligned message together. So I think creating, and, and of course we have such support in, in, in uh, Pittsburgh, but how do you find those folks that are right there sort of under your, under your nose that can be an be a, um, ally with you? I think the other thing, though, is that we really need to push that screen time is not what we're talking about. We have to separate the two. And I know it's not going to happen overnight, but I think that that is doing us, that, that is keeping us behind, that we have to have definitions that separate those, those two. So I think that convening conversations like this with the um, notion of elevating the workforce and including a broader range of people like we've talked about, include the parents, include the um, teachers, librarians, and researchers more frequently and right away to, to get the level of understanding uh, aligned. I'd also like to ask a research question, mm -hmm. and this, this hit me today. and. I'm wondering, do we have research on why um, the iPad is something that parents seem to really like doing with their children? Have we just addressed that? Because I, I think that if we could talk about that more, that I think it breaks down the sort of that it's passive or there's something innately wrong with it or what's good about it. I think that we need to talk about what is the iPad doing for us as adult learners? because. You know, I've learned a lot of things on that iPad that I never thought I would ever learn. Think about it, both from my children and from my husband. But I think that, the, I think that this device is sparking something about how we learn as adults. So maybe that's why we want to do it with our kids, because we, it's sparking something in, in us as well that we haven't experienced yet. Maybe it's like Monopoly was when it was first invented. It was so new, everybody loved it, it was a great game. It's still a great game. But I think there's something there in that. And I would like to see some more research about that. So we're going to open it up for questions. I am, during this question time, going to have my phone out. Um, <laughs> because um, we're going to be taking questions on Twitter. So if you are not in the room here with us, but you have a burning question, please tweet it. Um, use the hashtag, hashtag beyond screen time, and I will get it on my phone. And hopefully, I will ask it if time permits. So um, all right, who has a question, ma'am? Thank you. Um, my name is Edna Ronk. I live in the District of Columbia and have been in the early childhood field for a long time. And I'd like to answer Michelle's question about the iPad. There is an article in the March issue of Young Children, call, and I forget what it's called. I just gave a copy to Lisa. Yeah. It's written by Jean Geist, a professor at the Ohio State University, and it's on using tablets. Using tablet, using tablet commuters with, the print gets light, but it's with toddlers. And 
and very young children. And he actually works with two-year-olds and under two. And he goes into some, he's done some research on it. So you can check that. Um, I would like to address two elephants in the room. Ma'am, could you put it in the form of a question, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, th there will be a question. Um, th there are two words we haven't talked about too much. We've skirted around them. And I would like you to use what we've talked about today uh, to address these two. They're two words that have a very negative image in the United States in many cases, not all, but you'll know what I mean. The first word is play, which is considered by many a waste of time. Um, they're just playing. They aren't learning anything. And those of us who are here know better, but it's a policy issue. And the second gov word is government, which has been considered a waste of everything this past year. And as a political science major when I was very young, uh, that, that whole experience in the fall disturbed me terribly. I really, really, really did. So I would like you to think about how um, the media and all the words that we've used, digital and technology and whatever, um, can be used to address the negative aspects of play and government. Thank you. I'm just going to make a quick comment. Uh, it's ironic, but play is often thrown at those of us who want to talk about digital media yes, as the thing is, that they can't it? do, <laughs> right? So the same people who might be saying play isn't learning are saying, oh, but they can't. They're not playing when they're using this. So I think we're using these words, you know, to, to kind of make counter arguments. Uh, and I think that's careful. Here, here's another one. Hands on. Okay. Is this hands on? I could make an argument that this is very hands-on, but it's not hands-on with three-dimensional objects, right? So the, we're, we're tripping over some of our most deeply held beliefs around early childhood. So I'm not going to take on the government question. <laughs> I'll leave that to someone else. But I think that um, I, I think that technology has an opportunity for us to be able to assess the value of play and how it helps children learn. So not only by what they're doing on the screen, but how we use technology to assess how children are learning in the housekeeping area. So message for me is, is a wonderful um, uh, uh, example of that, right? When you're actually using pictures that now have a message to them to use them to assess what a child is learning. What you didn't know about the, about the teacher in there, that that actually is a school where children have hearing impairments. So when she talked about the new vocabulary, she was literally talking about words about children that have never spoken before. So I think it has this opportunity to capture what children are actually learning through their play in a way that we really didn't have before, except with the Polaroid picture. Remember how excited we were with the Polaroid pictures? That was huge in our field, right? <laughs> Could capture things. I think we can actually capture the learning through play. I would just say that we actually term in our libraries um, our early learning area as a literacy playground and um, we're going to be incorporating more digital media and lots of libraries already are that are actually in the playground as we would call it um, to send that message that this is a viable means of play as well as learning or learning through play. Great. And so I have a question from Twitter, which is, how can we proactively play a role in app development for young children? And I'll let you all decide who we in that question <laughs> might be. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so go now I'll give you a, a real life experience. So we actually had um, what, we, what we coined an unconference mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, hosted by the Pittsburgh AYC and many, many partners in this room, where we actually had an opportunity to have a hackathon where everyday early childhood teachers, everyday early childhood teachers brought an idea to the table about an app that could help them with their teaching. Mm -hmm. Not an app for children, an app that could help them with their teaching. And because we have such, such resource, like Ela and other folks uh, from Carnegie Mellon and many other places, they actually got to spend a whole day with app developers who listened to what it was like for them being everyday early childhood teachers. Talk about powerful learning on both parts, right? So it's about those everyday opportunities. How do you make those opportunities where early childhood teachers get in the room with people who develop apps, 
Remember, people who develop apps are probably between 20-something and 40-something, right? Probably. They probably have little children. They're probably in a child care center. We have to tell our field to tap into the parents that they serve. We have, we have such a lost, we have lost that opportunity. We have to find that opportunity. So get them in the room together and let them talk to, to each other. So. This conversation is happening. Um, Warren Buckleitner from Children's Technology Review hosts a conference called Duster Magic, which is a room full of developers and a couple of us in the back who are child <laughs> development people, reminding them that we need to think about how children learn. Um, and I would add to your definition that the developers I'm meeting are young, male, not married, no kids, and have an end of one understanding of children, <laughs> which is their own childhood, right? So there's a challenge here. Um, but, I, but the same folks are saying, how do we do this right. better? And the, and the developers who are starting to really think nicely about child development and development, mm -hmm. uh, Toka Boca comes to example, are having economic success in the marketplace. That'll drive the, the need to have to, to do app development that actually yeah. supports um, learning and development in a different way. So I, 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 well, all my, my um, call out to all of us is just get in the conversation. Can, can, uh, can I add something fun yeah. about that? that um, so they're male and they don't have children and they're young and people in our world are female. Mm -hmm. They're not married. It was kind of <laughs> neat to see these folks. <laughs> <laughs> Development. Yeah, <laughs> we were, we're like, how do we tap a happy hour and <laughs> actually make them, they're like, hour. whoa, there's a whole bunch of young women coming to this. So. I know children's librarians are, are dying to get in the conversation yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Well, that's one way to help market it, right? That's right. <laughs> um, any questions in the room? Um, uh, sir? Hi, I'm Rob Lippincott, formerly of PBS, now with something called I2 Capital Group. Um, my question is, we've been talking a lot today about uh, all kinds of new ways of learning or aiding learning with technology. Is it, from a policy perspective, the right way to think about technology as kind of a shortcut to the common core, as many people have been talking about? It's a more productive way of teaching vocabulary, English language arts, math. Or is it really the sort of key, this doorway to all kinds of other things, design thinking and creativity and uh, assessment and measurement and so forth? In other words, is it, a, is it a ruse to think of it as a shortcut to Common Core? Or is that something that's an easy win that we should get out of the way from a policy perspective? I don't, I'll take a crack and then, um, I wouldn't say it's a shortcut. Um, I would say in, in some sense it's, it's kind of strange to have a um, policy conversation when you're talking about pedagogy in classrooms because you really don't want to dictate for teachers what they should be able to do. But we have to to some extent, right? Because we want to prevent harm and we want to promote good. But so to the extent that technology and digital media is just another tool that teachers can choose to integrate into their classrooms to support outcomes, whether it's towards the common core or towards the early learning standards, I think that's, from my perspective at least, how we sort of need to approach that. But that said, we all know, and the reason we're all in this room, is because technology and digital media are so invigorating to current classrooms. It is really engaging material. And when you have the right prompts, it can be such a powerful tool. Um, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily a shortcut so much as another tool that can help us get there. And because we want to avoid the either or dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. It isn't either the shortcut or all these other things. Right. It needs to be both, and, and we need to take advantage of what works best. And we need the community to talk to each other. Um, while the researchers are, are catching up um, to a, our understanding, we have teachers using these tools who need to be talking to other teachers about what works, what doesn't work, what I tried. Librarians are, are trying to think. We, we need that conversation, that community of practice around this. Um, find the early adopters, and let's get them talking to each other. So I think we want to avoid it being just a shortcut, too, because then I, I worry that it won't be developmentally appropriate anymore, and then it turns into right. something that children, it's not about what, what is interesting, that it interests the child. So. so here's another Twitter question. At Kids Media Doc would like to know, how might the early childhood education and the pediatric community come together to have a more productive conversation about this stuff? Cool, what better time than right now? <laughs> when one of the voices of the AAPS has decided that perhaps there's more to these things than we've seen before, and is opening up the conversation and, and calling on his own colleagues to revisit uh, a statement that really has a definition of, of, di of screen time that's out of date. Mm -hmm. It's one of the people that I called out. So I, th I think there's a better opportunity than ever. I don't think we're oppositional. I think we, we agree a lot more than we disagree. 
Um, and I think if we can start to bring people to those tables um, and get pediatricians um, offering advice in, in their offices that's like what librarians are offering and what early childhood teachers, now we're, now we're on to something. I think at the state level, we're lucky in Pennsylvania that we have a pediatrician that sits on our um, early learning council. So I think states should look at that and say, is there a pediatrician there that can be part of this conversation to help to help move policy? Then also on the um, local level, we have some local pedi pediatricians sitting with us and, and talking to us about how do we have a common language together. So we have to pick a, take a proactive approach to that, I think. And we have to accept that it's a medical model versus right. a developmental model. We're not all going to be talking the same language all the time. And if it's do no harm and, and make sure children are healthy, that's one conversation. And then we're wanting to dig deeper into what's developmentally positive. So one more question from Twitter before we wrap the panel up. Um, you know, as people are talking about the need to think about outcomes in early childhood education, um, which we know may be critical to addressing some of our resource issues. Um, are there ways we could use new technology to do that in a way that is developmentally appropriate and fun for kids, even as we're collecting info? I mean, I think Michelle's point earlier about the great potential for assessment in developmentally appropriate ways that technology offers and the efficiencies that offers is there's huge potential there and some of the common assessments that we've been using in early childhood that are pretty time intensive that require a teacher sitting with a child doing an assessment individually there's great potential to make those assessments continue to have them be play-based but digitize them such that it adapts to them it gives teachers feedback immediately so then they can individualize learning based on that feedback and then ideally that they can document that progress for these other reporting systems that now early childhood programs are more and more being required to report up to. I'll just add to that that one thing you never see about Message For Me, but to me is the, is the best part about it, is the back end mm -hmm. that actually shows us how, how uh, parents are talking to their children, what is the response, what, what teachers are saying. So we can actually go back and see a, see a history of um, um, how it's being used. And then if, if we can get that, that to talk to whatever reporting system the teacher has to do, so that's where geniuses come in. Because I think there's, there's lots of reporting that has to be done. It would be my dream that you could do it once and it could talk to all the other systems because teachers are spending a lot of time entering data for different assessments. Lots of times, which wouldn't it be great if we could take a picture and it would be able to determine what the child has learned. So right? it's a so tool. We need to use it intentionally and appropriately. Teachers need to be able to make decisions about what a tool for what assessment, mm -hmm. a tool for um, promoting learning. That's why we need this in teacher preparation programs. We can't just expect teachers to know how to do these things unless we have the opportunity to, to help them. And librarians as well. We need the professional development. I think that was a great note to wrap up on since we're out of time. So Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you. So thank you. Um, thanks, Sarah, for guiding that conversation. I just thought it was really um, it's kind of invigorating to think about. It, it feels like we're already, in many ways, we've already kind of break in, broken through um, in terms of what, what seemed like such a dichotomy. Even two years ago, when I was starting to explore these issues, it felt like there were um, some you know, places where there just we wouldn't be able to kind of maybe even have shared conversations. Mm -hmm. And I did want to mention is in that qu question about pediatricians and early learning um, developmental experts kind of coming together. Um, I, I wanted you all to know that um, in this event, in fact, in, in, in other settings as well, we're reaching out to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Ari Brown um, was invited and just couldn't make it because of her schedule, but I know the AAP is, um, is watching. We really hope to be engaged in more and more conversations 
with them. Um, Dmitry Christakis, who is a very well-known researcher at the University of Washington, who was referenced earlier, um, who has been writing a lot about media and young kids, um, and has been looking recently at content and some of the, the differences there that very much aligns with what those in the learning community have been looking at when it relates to content. Um, he, too, was really interested in this conversation and, and just couldn't make it out here. So I feel like we're at a place where there are people um, across the country who may have come from different angles on this um, maybe five years ago, even two years ago, but want to find, a, find some common ground. I also um, feel the urgency so much from parents in part because a lot of what I do is go out and, and talk to parent groups, um, uh, partly because of my, my previous research. And the number of questions, I mean, I'll have like six or seven parents lining up with very specific questions about, should I be using FaceTime for this long with my 14-month-old? Or, ooh, is that app not a good one to download? Or, I mean, a lot of them are worried, a lot of them are excited. It's sometimes both in the same question. And um, boy, what a shame if those who are um, the the early educators um, and the librarians and the pediatricians and, and the lives of these families that they can't answer these questions for parents. We're missing a huge, huge opportunity to help them. So I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way. And now, I agree with everything. Um, <laughs> it's just a real pleasure to have Ellen and Michael here. I'll just do a quick introduction for those of you who don't know. Ellen Wartella is the <laughs> oh gosh, I'm say the whole entire <laughs> don't, title, don't. the Sheikh <laughs> Hamed bin. Khalifa Al Thani, professor of communication and professor of psychology, um, and professor of human development and <laughs> social policy at Northwestern <laughs> University. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and so and, and Ellen um, has been looking at these issues for 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 years, um, and was someone as I've started digging into the research that I've certainly relied on. Michael Levine is the executive director, um, this is easier, at the Joan Vance <laughs> Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. Um, for those who don't know, and you can probably describe this better than I, but the Joan Vance Cooney Center is, is, is separate from the research, um, the researchers within Sesame Workshop. Jennifer Cotler Clark is here from Sesame, who, and she and Rosemary Truly and others do the, the deep research on Sesame Street and other Sesame products. The Joan Vance Cooney Center is looking kind of in a way beyond and outside of that space um, and thinking kind of about what's over the horizon. And, um, and full disclosure, Michael and I are working on a project together right now for the campaign for grade level reading on um, early literacy and where technology fits in, in that realm. So I wanted to just take a moment, given that I knew that they were coming, kind of I pulled them in <laughs> to just um, have a moment to wrap up a little bit and to hear some of their takes on this. We did um, get some interesting and, and I think uh, creative action item ideas out of some of the, the panels and there may be more um, that we can generate during the happy hour because, you know, wine and beer often helps in that regard. But <laughs> I'm going to list a few of them and, um, and see what you think and then I'll let the two of you just talk for a little bit. So we've got until about 4.30 and okay. then we'll break. So here are some things that came up in that first panel. Um, so Lauren Rubenzahl um, at uh, Children's Hospital of Boston was talking about the need to really, um, is, is there a way we could create resources in one place, easy to use resources for parents um, so that they could, and Lauren, I'm probably putting the wrong, the wrong words on this exactly, but really so that they could understand better how they could use their own language and questions to um, interact with children around, around media, but just in their own, um, own lives, you know, really kind of spark conversation. Um, Shelley um, Pasnick had suggested that we really need to get into communities and really understand the needs on the ground in communities um, before making assumptions about what technology might be needed or whether it's not needed, right, in different communities, and really start kind of digging into what's happening in local places. Ila has um, pointed out the, certainly the importance of, um, of partnering, uh, math science partnerships is, is what we have down here, that the uh, ability to bring those who are working in the realm of research, bring them together with educators to um, see what might be possible in, in, in generating new environments for kids. And Ila 
please feel free to, to jump in with, with more yeah, on that one. It's best to remember, Lisa. It is. OK. <laughs> Leslie um, Rotenberg from PBS um, pointed out that we really need much more community engagement and support um, around uh, early, early learning programs and how media fits into them. In our last panel, Michelle um, pointed out just in her comments, and this wasn't even at the end, but I just started writing them down, that there were three things that she wanted to see happen. Better connectivity in classrooms, using badging or other kinds of, uh, and this is in a, a technology in itself, to recognize the competencies that may exist in our early childhood workforce or to motivate those um, who may have some of those competencies to, to acquire them, I mean, or who, who want those competencies to acquire them and to be more flexible in the way we think about professional development hours um, and to include libraries, to include that moment when an early childhood teacher might go to a library to be part of a workshop to recognize that that too might be part of that teacher's learning even if the librarian offering the workshop doesn't necessarily have the exact right credential. Um, other things that came up um, during the end of the conversation just a few minutes ago. Um, starting to really leverage conversations like this, I'm all up for that, to have deeper conversations on te teacher preparation generally. Uh, or, I mean, I'm sorry, teacher preparation more specifically. And make sure that when we talk about teachers and educators, we're, we're wide enough to include librarians and other early literacy or early math specialists in that educator mix. Um, another action I'm take an inventory of what policies um, are either getting in the way of or causing kind of the wrong and maybe inappropriate use of um, technology. So getting in the way of good practice or causing bad practice when it comes to technology's use. And Sarah suggested, well, and I didn't really suggest, but I think it came out of your question, that wait, is there a tool to do that? Yeah. And um, gosh, maybe there isn't. And does there need to be a, a tool created to help take that inventory? Of, of what's happening in, in, um, in localities and then through policy generally. Last two, um, start to bring different people around the table. So it's not just the early childhood community talking to the early childhood community and not just the pediatricians talking to the pediatricians. Um, how can we spark what's happened in Pittsburgh where they have you know, robotics professors talking to preschool teachers? Like, wow, how, how, do, we get, how do we get to that? Um, and then lastly, what kind of research could be done on how tablets or these kinds of portable screens are, um, are helping adult learners maybe even make more visible their own learning or recognizing what, they, what their needs are? OK. <sighs> <laughs> Someone want to write a paper I mean, about all that? And some of that, <laughs> um, that is Go a great, for it. great wrap up. Um, hi, everybody. Lots of action <laughs> items. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually, I had jotted down some of those things, and I had um, four observations that overlap, and then I had six action items. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want you to know that I, I do have them down here. <laughs> um, the four observations were yes, this bigger community. First of all, congratulations. I won't spend too much time, but this is a rare sighting, and Thanks. the policy yeah. brief is excellent. Yeah. And I think yeah, that. Great you have started over the last few years, you know, with others in the field, a tremendously important conversation. I think that what you just identified around the community of practice, who needs to come together, I think was signaled and modeled by this convening. We need more of it. That the fact that Lauren was on the same panel as Leah is really an indication of something that's right. So we need a reframing that is not just health and consumption oriented and not just learning and pathway to common core oriented. We need okay. the kind of integration that is inextricable around human development. So mm -hmm. Elle and I are both sort of you know, ecological systems <laughs> theorists, so <laughs> we're going to say this. So what's, what, what, what's the pathway? And I think that we're making progress on who the new community is, but we need to really do a lot more on these inextricable you know, community mm -hmm. ties. And mm -hmm. getting like one action item there is if we could find a way to get AAP, NYC, ALA, you know, these professional standard SRCD. bearers, SRCD, mm -hmm. in roughly the same place, roughly the same place, that would be actually a lot of progress. And I think it's going to come up from the roots of places like Pittsburgh. Second, very quick, 
you know, observation. Stop generalizing. This mm -hmm. came out in sort of your opening comments. Let's have an honest discussion. Not all screens are equal. Not all consumption is equal. I thought that Shelley added very significantly to the three C's conversation. You didn't, you didn't bring that up, but I thought uh, her three C's of um, uh, the Cash, caregivers. Has them in caregivers. Yeah, mm -hmm. the caregivers. We had a lot of commentary about the caregivers, and you know, the creativity C also was something that Aaliyah was all about. Let's let's yeah. reintroduce, given the structure. So the infrastructure for early childhood is weaker than for healthcare or for K to 12. But that flexibility and that lack of infrastructure might actually be a real advantage to us if we took advantage. If, if we mm -hmm. skipped a little bit of a mm -hmm. generation of program design and we thought about technology and media in a new way, that flexibility might actually be a real benefit. So that's, and, and the, the cash and the equity, the equity chasm, those were really, really interesting things, mm -hmm. you know, as far as I was concerned. Um, and then just a couple of the action ideas. Yes, I do think that we need a new kit, a new resource, a new way to use the mediatricians and the, you know, developmental lists in the room. Um, in, in common enterprise, I think that's a good challenge for this group. It's a good challenge for the alliance that I'm a member of. Um, I thought that it was a really, really interesting challenge that um, both Chip and Shelley, you know, brought up, which was, and I, I miss, I missed this in terms of my first question. It's not really about productivity. It is in policy language. Well, an assessment, as, as Michelle was starting to talk about, you know, the amount of stuff that teachers this, have to write yeah, down. Yeah, this issue totally of actually good. using technology for assessment productivity, but also for innovation and for reinventing, you know, practice is something that we really need to talk about. And then, and then finally, um, I thought Mark um, Bogrosian, uh, and, and we've been doing some work on this, so I'm a little bit self-interested, this issue of dual generation approaches mm -hmm. is fundamental mm -hmm. to moving in the next direction, mm -hmm. whether it's around, you know, what we expect a child to be on the pathway, what we expect an adult to be on in certain lifelong learning. So we're, I, I think our field has a possibility, my last thing to say, to go from um, these the sort of pathways that relate to you know, educational skills to pathways that relate to life, life, lear lifelong learning. If we can get the normative experience of the children you know, in the very early ages as sort of a down payment for a new model, Ellen and I were talking about this, and maybe she'll pick it up, a new model in which we were really much more clear what we expected kids to be at the end of the loop yeah. or along the loop, then we'd have a much more intelligent conversation about mm -hmm. why it is or why it isn't that we have technology being introduced into playful learning, mm -hmm. creativity, and intentional education along the line. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. So why don't I take it from there? Mm -hmm. um, I thought that, that um, the panel about uh, research was interesting. and. The two, one of the takeaways I had from that was um, from Ela and um, Shelley's comments that, that both of you really articulated a vision of what you want this child to grow up to be as an adult. And I don't think we talk about that very much. What kind of an adult do we want? Um, I thought it was interesting, Ela, you want an adult who is creative in and using all kinds of technology as a tool and solving what will be the future generation's problems that may not be our problems. And that, I'm, I'm right there. I agree with you. And Shelley, I thought your comments bespoke a, an interest in having, um, even in this era of where technology is everywhere all the time and will only be more so in all likelihood in future generations, um, an adult who appreciates human relationships and personal relationships and connectedness with people. You know, I think we should spend some time. What is it that we want our children to grow up to be? And I don't mean just, yes, I want my child to be healthy, and yes, I want my child to have a career that's successful and, and a family, but what kind of world do we expect them to enter, and how do we get there? And that, I think we don't spend time with at all. Um, and I don't think we, you really prompted me to think about that, and Michael and I started to yeah. have a discussion of where, where does technology fit, because it's in all likelihood, um, technology is not an an, an, an extra. It is now integrated in the development of human beings. Just one aside, um, asking about how you integrate technology into these other areas. About a half a dozen years or so ago, I, I was on some 
rant, and I don't remember why, but I looked at all introductory child development textbooks that were available in the country. And I found on average of a 300 to 400 page textbook, about a half a dozen pages at most devoted to any media. And most of what they were teaching people who were studying child development was how bad television violence was for children. No appreciation whatsoever in the education about child development the changing nature of children's realities, which is their integration in, into a technologized world. I suspect that hasn't changed very much. Yeah. Um, maybe now there will be a few more pages that talk about computers. And my explanation of why we like tablets is because we think of them as computer-like, not television-like. And screen is really a substitute for television, if you go back and look at what all of those earlier um, um, proclamations about not having children have screen time. They really meant, don't let your child watch entertainment television. Mm -hmm. um, so we could get rid of screens, because that's irrelevant now. What we really should be talking about is uh, the content and, and technologies, as far as I'm concerned. So that's one point. Who do we want our children to be? Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, and I'm not just pandering to, the, to one of the people who supported this conference, which again, it is wonderful. And thank you for inviting me back. I had a great time <laughs> in the fall, and I'm having a great time here. But I think we should take a look at um, what's going on in Pittsburgh as a model to be taken around, around the country. If there is a place, and here are the Grable Foundation and the other foundations in Pittsburgh, should hats off to you. What you've created at a community level, which is digestible for parents and teachers and children, is a community that cares about children in a multiplicity of ways, and in which technology is secondary to the larger questions about children's development. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, I had the privilege with Lisa, actually, with yeah, the three yeah. of us. It's all, about <laughs> aiming, it's all about aiming high, you right. guys. We, yeah. we, uh, we had the privilege of being, of being on the same visit to Pittsburgh, and I still use examples of things that I've learned. and, and uh, the ability to integrate at that local level is so important because that's where parents and children live and to be able to integrate across institutions. So that was the second point that I wanted to make. Let's use Kids Pittsburgh as a model for what yeah. we try to take to our local communities. And I had a third question that I wanted. Um, you know, I think it's a really good question if we think about who we want our children to be of what really are the skills we want children, young children to have. There's this this uh, speeding up of what our expectations are. Um, we, what we expected several years, you know, when, when Sesame Street was started, we wanted to teach uh, kindergartners, four, five and six-year-olds, their letters from, uh, eight, eight, to recognize all the letters and their numbers from one to 10. Well, now we aim to teach far more than that to, to two-year-olds. We have such higher expectations for what we want from children. And I wonder to what extent this playfulness of technology and this inter integration of technology is going to speed that up even more. And I think we really need to think about yeah, um, yeah. children's lives in a different way and, and maybe slowing down for more playfulness. And I'll shut up because we only have one more minute. That's fabulous. Okay. So I, I know that many of you may have comments and questions, and I encourage lots of conversation You're during so the break. Time. I am so on time. I can't believe it. Um, and I uh, and I and I really want to encourage you, um, those of you out there watching, as well as those of you in the room, to be in touch with us here at New America. Um, certainly, to be in touch with the, the members of of the alliance as they're thinking about their you know next steps. But if there's something that I don't know, even if it's like, eh, I don't think you got it wrong. Like, I really want you to like think harder about this. Tell me, tell us, right? Because um, I think we have to have this as an open conversation as much as possible. Can I make one last 10 second comment? Yes, yes. So the brief wasn't discussed enough today. It's and I want, to, I want to encourage folks in the room as well as us, and I'm sure Lisa will too, but as a friend of Lisa's, mm -hmm. to comment on this. And actually, I've already Please. begun in my notes on the brief to formulate specific action steps that we could take as a down payment towards the policy agenda. There's very provocative questions in here. There's actually directional questions in the brief that would lead to actions like, you know, looking at the actors, looking at looking at the class, looking, you know, and, and thinking mm -hmm. careful yeah. thoughts about the role of technology and media in these different instruments of professional reform, for example. 
And so I think that as a community, we should embrace the brief as a little bit of a set of guideposts for us to move over the next six to 12 months. And in particular, given all the introduction and all the interest allegedly in the administration right now in early childhood, I completely concur with that. And here's an example of where we can, I, I think it's a terrific brief, we could all be on the same page and aligned in the way that you're asking for, Michelle, that we could all be aligned in pushing forward. So please stay in this well, space, Lisa. So since, you, yeah. since your first Good. book, you've Good. been really important <laughs> to us. So it's really awesome. important. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much, you guys, for being here.